Okay, this was shot on film, and we're all shooting digital now. But the downside of that is it's permanently then in the image. You know, there's no going back afterwards and changing it. If you put a filter in front of the lens and you shot it with a you know color graduated look, it's permanently that way. There's no taking it out afterwards, and that's that's why things have changed a bit since these days. And now a lot of that more aesthetic or look building we do in post because then we have full control. We can make it really a heavy look, we can turn it down. Um, but anyway, it's a fun example because everybody, we've all seen it. Um, and it's a really classic look. Um, where the DP used a lot of uh, used a lot of different filters to create the look. But, but but still today you will be able to with the tools that you have today you will be able to. Oh yeah, you'll be able to create this, but you'll be able to create it in post, <coughs> um, in color grading. Mm -hmm. And then the thing is, you've got way more control, you know. Um, so the the trend now is to shoot clean mm -hmm. and then to be able to work on your look and your grading post. But they didn't have you know the same level of DaVinci Resolve. Type of tools that, that then that we do now. So anyway, that was just something for fun. Um, so we're going to look at. I want to make sure this is set up properly. Okay, good. Look creation. 
So you know the difference between a very wide depth of field and a very shallow depth of field. So a shallow depth of field is that look that we associate, we tend to associate with a cinematic look, where you've got a very, very uh, restricted or small range of distance from the camera lens that is in focus. And your foreground is, is out of focus and your background is out of focus and you've got nice uh, bokeh or blur on point light sources in the background. It's that, it's that classic cinematic feel. Um, now that look, a shallow depth of field, um, is I'm, I'm going into stuff now that I'm going to go into later. But anyway, um, it's achieved at a wider or more open iris or open aperture on your lens. Um, and in low light conditions, that's fine. You want to let in as much light as possible, you know, to achieve a good exposure. So typically, your aperture will be quite wide open. You'll be at f 2.8 or f 2, and you're going to naturally get a shallow depth of field. But what if you want that shallow depth of field out on the beach in the middle of the day? You can't shoot at f2 because you're just your frame is white. It's completely overexposed. There's way too much light. So how do we do that in D filters? In D filters, let us cut down the amount of light, sometimes drastically, before it even hits the lens, um, so that we can achieve a shallow depth of field even in very bright conditions. So we'll look at that a little bit more closely later. Uh, we can control contrast ratio. Um, with filters. So again, example is if you think about a landscape, um, again, typically outside, daylight, sunlight, bright conditions, um, a cityscape. Think about a cityscape. Uh, you've got a bright sky and you've got slightly, you've got darker, you know, uh, urban cityscape below. Okay? So that gives you uh, a fairly large difference in brightness or contrast between how bright the sky is and the brightness of the details in the, in the cityscape below. So what we can do is we can use a, a graduated ND or an ND grad to bring down the light on the top half of the frame and let all of the light through on the bottom half of the frame. So we kind of equalize a little bit the bright and the darker area to give us a well-exposed image with a lot of image information that we can use. Um, so that's an example of control and contrast ratio. Um, minimize unwanted glare. Um, we're going to look at this more closely with colorizing filters. Um, and a big one is enhancing skin tones and also smoothing or, or beautifying skin tones. Um, the diffusion filters are used for that a lot. Um, and sometimes it can be a bit too much, but uh, you know there's different strengths of filters as well. We'll look at that. So some of the lower strengths um, will create just very nice effect without being too obvious. Um, and then created image enhancement. And again, the created image enhancement side, like we looked at with that top gun intro, um, it could be created with filters permanently on what you're recording, but more likely, it's nowadays we're doing it in post, we're doing it in color correction. So we'll look at those filters anyway quickly, but they're not so used. So it's all about enhancing your images. So in terms of uh, why, again, looking at why you would invest in a set of filters or why you would you know, look at using filters when you shoot. Um, so that's the whole thing. Many image enhancements can be achieved in color correction during post, uh, but not all of them. And especially with cameras and formats that have limited color bit depth and limited dynamic range. Um, so what do I mean by limited color bit depth? Um, I'm talking about any cameras that shoot what we know as 8, we call 8 bit color. Um, I'm not going to get into the technical details of color bit depth here, but basically um, it has to do with how many um, shades uh, between black and white um, you know, your uh, image has in it, basically. So, you know, your, our image, we can break it down into three channels. For instance, a red channel, a green channel, and a blue channel. Everybody following me so far? That make up the whole colored image. So if we take just one of those channels, let's say, arbitrarily, let's take the red channel, move the other two out of the way for now, we're just looking at the red channel. If we then strip the red off of it and make it just monochrome, black to white, there is a number of steps of shades of gray between black and white that 
256 possible shades between black and white. Um, that's it. So you've got in the red channel, you've got between 0 to 255. Um, in the green channel and in the blue channel, you've also got between 0 and 255. So that creates your image. Um, now it sounds like a lot, it actually works out to 16.7 million possible colors, possible combinations. But um, if you've ever shot with, you know, a lot, a lot of our cameras we shoot with are 8-bit, especially the more consumer oriented cameras, like the Sony Alpha cameras, the Panasonic GH4, um, any of our cell phones, which yes, are taking better and better quality video, but they're still recording 8-bit color. Um, any of these types of cameras, we're dealing with 8-bit color. Um, now what can happen is to go back to that example of a cityscape with a bright sky and a darker you know, foreground, um, the difference in brightness can be too extreme. Um, and we shoot it in our 8-bit color with our Sony A7S or our A7S II or our GH4 or whatever it is. We get that file into our editing software or into DaVinci Resolve and we want to enhance the sky. So we create a mask, masking out the sky, and a curve, and we try to bring out more depth in the sky. But what happens? Has anybody tried this sometimes? You get banding sometimes. Every, anybody seen banding? Where you start to sometimes see specific bands of blue in the sky. Um, it's not smooth gradation from deep blue at the top of the frame to lighter blue where it starts to meet the horizon it breaks down into to bands. Now that happens because we don't have enough color information. So that's why our more, I don't know, our higher end or more professional cinema cameras will record at least 10-bit color. With 10-bit color, you've got not between 0 and 255, but between 0, uh, counting 0, so it's 256 in total. But you've got actually between 0 and uh, 1,023. So you've got 1,024 total values um, in each red, green, and blue channel. So you get a lot more color information. You can go crazy with your curves in color correction, and the image will not break down, it won't fall apart. You'll still get perfectly smooth color transitions. Um, so one thing filters are good for is if you're using a camera where 10-bit color is not an option, you, you know you're only going to get 8-bit color depth, so again, this is a Panasonic UH4, it's a Sony A7S II, it's, it's any camera like that. One thing you can do is use a filter, uh, an ND grad, which is a graduated ND filter. It's strong at the top and it's clear at the bottom. Um, to bring in the camera while you're shooting, bring down the exposure level in the sky and leave the exposure level in the foreground, you know, where it is. And then you're making the best use of your eight bits of color as possible. Hopefully that makes sense. But anyway. Um, so yeah, especially with cameras of limited color grid depth or dynamic range, um, which a lot of us use, and they're good cameras, I'm not saying anything bad about them. Um, but a set of ND filters or ND grads can really make a difference sometimes, depending on what you're shooting. Um, so exposure and contrast ratio um, can be controlled optically in camera before it's recorded, um, uh, resulting in a wider range of useful image information being recorded. So um, that's, that's, that's one of the main reasons. Any questions so far? Because that was a bit technical. So, okay. We're going to look at it in camera. There's a lot of camera here as well. So. Um, just some advantages. I didn't want to make this thing about Tiffin particularly. Um, so just some advantages of Tiffin filters over the others. Yes, they are a bit more expensive. Um, but they do use a specific uh, technology called Color Core, um, which is a process where they actually have the filter material sandwiched in between two pieces of optical glass. Um, and then it's ground perfectly flat. Uh, whereas some of the less expensive filters it, the, it's actually the glass itself that's treated. Um, so instead of it being the, the layer that's doing the work being a very thin layer of sandwich, it's the entire glass thickness has a particular color tint or a particular something to it. Um, so that's one of the advantages. Um, they also offer a 10 year manufacturer warranty on different filters. Um, so they really believe in, in, in the quality of the production as well. 
emission of light that it's cutting up. So basically, with a polarizer, you can get rid of all of this glare and all of this reflection. Yeah, yeah, reflection. Um, and I'm just using a body of water because it's a good example, but there's all kinds of things that it can improve. But you can see how you can basically see the bottom of this water here. Um, this, is, this is what a polarizer will do for you. Um, it gets rid of all this glare and all this reflection. Um, so that's an example of a, of a polarizer. And again, it's something that is optical. It's not something you can do in post-production. Um, if you've recorded this image, this detail does not exist. It was not recorded in your file. So you can't bring it out. There's no polarizing filter plugging. Um, it, it was not recorded. It doesn't exist. So the way to clear up this kind of glare and reflection is to use a polarizing filter. Um, I've got one here, which is quite clever, but I'll show it to you at the end. Um, so that's polarizers. So they come in different forms. You, you'll get a linear polarizer, a circular polarizer, a low light polarizer, a warm polarizer, and what's called an ultra pole polarizer. So linear um, is the most common polarizer. Um, and so that's all you need to know. If you're really looking for a standard polarizer, you look for a linear polarizer. Um, it deepens the intensity of blue skies. Um, and, and it reduces or completely eliminates glare and unwanted reflection. Uh, a circular polarizer is basically, it's, it's, it has the same effect as a linear polarizer, um, but it works better on some cameras which have autofocus functionality. Um, so a linear polarizer can sometimes throw off your camera's autofocus if you're using a DSLR or a mirrorless. Um, the circular polarizer will have the same effect, but it works better in, with other photos. Um, a low light polarizer, um, it's a more intense polarizer, um, where it works in low light conditions where a normal polarizer filter is not strong enough. Uh, there's not enough light coming through for it to, to, to have any effect. Um, you've got a warm polarizer, uh, this is just a combination of a of a polarizing filter and a warming, like a warming filter, what they call their 812. Um, it warms skin tones a bit. Um, and then you've got an ultra pole polarizer. So this is a linear, there's a linear ultra pole and a circular ultra pole, and those basically give the best polariz uh, polarization effect. So they're more expensive, but they're designed to be the best polarizer filter. So mm, I'm not going to spend too much time on. Explained out of all these filters we're going to go through, the four that are most important, a polarizer is actually one of those four. It is an important filter to know about and to have um, if you're going to invest in a set of filters. Um, so uh, now I think it's not this one. Okay, so Indies. Have we heard of Indies before? Okay. Um, indies we're going to actually look at the effects of them in the second half, so I won't spend too much time, but um, neutral density, it's the most common filters you, you're, you'll want, to be honest. Um, if you were going to invest in only one kind of filter, I would say it would need to be a set of NDs, um, even before a polarizer. Although I'd say a polarizer and a set of NDs, those are your most important, but if you were only investing in four filters, it would be a set of NDs at various strengths. Um, because they can be combined as well. Um, so, yeah, it's basically if you think about a pair of sunglasses that cuts down the light when you're driving, ND filters is the same thing for your camera. So, it's like putting on shades, it cuts down the incoming light. Um, so, yeah, they're manufactured either as a, as a completely solid filter. Um, I'll show you one here. There's a number of them. Yeah, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's in a number of. So this is a solid ND. Um, you can come up and grab a look later. But uh, this is a solid ND, and then there's also graduated NDs, which look more like this. I mean, they're not blue, but uh, it has an N it has this particular strength of ND at the top, and then it fades to clear. Um, so as I was mentioning in that example before, that kind of cityscape, that's the kind of filter that would reduce the amount of light 
in the sky area, but leaves the bottom uh, to come through, would be an ND grad. Um, ND grads are good to have. I wouldn't say that they should be the first filters you get. The solid NDs, probably a set of solid NDs are more important, and then later on adding a set of graduated NDs is useful too. Um, and they come with in, in like a soft edge or a hard edge. So the, the transition uh, area between ND filter and clear um, can be a very soft edge, like a feathered edge, or it can be a harder, like not like a line, but a harder edge. Uh, so it, it comes in as a soft edge or a hard edge. Um, and oh, yeah, the other important thing we're going to look at right at the end of this uh, workshop is IRNDs. Uh, we're going to look at infrared pollution. So with our digital sensors, our digital cameras today, uh, infrared light can be a big problem. Um, some manufacturers put a filter in front of the sensor, which cuts out infrared, but not all manufacturers do that. So like Blackmagic Design, for instance, is notorious because they do not have a infrared filter in front of their sensor. So it can make problems. Like when you use normal NDs, um, to bring down the amount of light. Uh, a normal ND will bring down the amount of visible light, but it will still let the infrared through. So what happens is your visible spectrum of light, your colors, your, your, your normal light you can see, gets drops down, but your infrared light st stays up. So you end up with these horrible blacks that don't look black anymore. They look kind of purple, reddish, you know? I'll show you some examples. Um, that's where infrared ND is. So an IRND is basically a combination ND with an infrared cut. So it cuts out the infrared. So for some cameras, some sensors, IRND is what you want. Um, for other cameras that have the manufacturers put an IR filter in front of the sensor, normal NDs will, will do. Um, you can always use IRNDs even if the camera has an ND sensor, I mean an IR cut in front of the sensor. So if you were buying a set of NDs to use for multiple cameras, IR NDs are going to work. Um, a lot of the IR NDs these days are a lot more popular. Um, people are buying those just because it, it takes care of the problem. Um, yeah, so solid uh, ND filters that can be soft edge or hard edge grad, or blender attenuator filters, which are even more blended. Um, so let's have a look at this fun software now because I can't show you something.
it's usually a 1.5. It depends. Different manufacturers have, actually have different uh, numbers. Um, but the number relates to how many stops of light um, that it can cut down. It's not a one-to-one -one ratio. Like an ND9, uh, an ND9 gives you three stops, um, three F stops lower. Uh,
worship. Again, this is all things we do in color grading. So it's not something you necessarily need to do with filters, but you can. Um, so I'll just show you some of the picture effects for our um, You've got the Thinking about buying at some point. They're not as important as your pro 
still use the diffusion filters, especially for skin tones and things like that. Um, there's just, there is a difference between doing it in camera and doing it in post afterwards. There, there is a difference. Um, so diffusion covers a wide variety of filters that affect one, two, or three dimensions of the recorded image. So resolution, light dispersal from uh, direct light sources like bright light sources or bright reflections, that's known as halation, um, and contrast. So those are the three three things that, that can be affected with the diffusion filter. So resolution, light dispersal, or also known as halation, and contrast. Those three things. So some diffusion filters will just affect one of those things, some will affect two, some will affect all three. Um, but again, they, they burn in character to the image. So the look that you're creating, again, remember, with any glass you put in front of the lens, it records that. Thing. These are all the different diffusion filters. Okay, there's a lot. Have any of you heard of any of these? Do any of these names? Promist. Promist. You guys heard people talk about Promist before? Or read articles where DPs have talked about Promist? Uh, Promist, the black Promist, the warm Promist. Promist filters are talked about a lot. Um, the satin filters are used quite a lot. The pearlescent are used quite a lot. Glimmer um, glass. Anybody heard of glimmer glass? These are all brand names, they're specific to Tiffin, um, but they're quite common actually. Um, and a lot of times uh, you might hear a DP uh, asking for a particular grade of glimmer glass or whatever. They, they come in different grades, uh, like a quarter, a half, a three quarter, or a full. And basically, it just the effect it has on the image is, is more or less. So, a quarter affects the image less than a half, or a, a three quarter, or a full. Um, and we're going to go into this a little bit more. I've got a little video to show you with, with before and afters and things that shot for an F55. Actually, it's a really good video. Um, uh, then diopters and close. Well, well, let's quickly look at a few. What we do with a few diffusion filters. Uh, but here in Auckland, I've got a very pretty young lady, um, which I didn't shoot, unfortunately. <laughs> So this is a glimmer glass, and again, it's a it's a it's a filter that's used a lot with uh, fashion photography. Um, it's also used in cinematography a lot with you know with people and things like that. Um, but basically, it affects the uh, how small details are rendered, fine details, and also halation. So you'll notice there's a glow to the skin tones. That's one of the effects of any diffusion filter. And how strong that effect is depends on whether it's a quarter or a half or a three quarter of that particular type of filter. So it will make highlights in the image, not just skin tones, but any highlights, it will make them have a glow. Um, that's what's called a halation. Um, it will also reduce, especially in skin tones, diffusion, uh, with skin, diffusion filters will reduce like small wrinkles. Very fine wrinkles, very fine blemishes in skin, it will get rid of them. But it will keep the resolution uh, the eyes, or in you know features, um, some of them affect the color more than others. Like the, the plain glimmer glass um, uh, desaturates a little bit, so you can see the colors are affected. How about the background? Is this a quarter? Or? This is a this is a full. Full. Um, quarter. Yes. That's a that's a glimmer glass one, and it's it's very subtle. Um, glimmer glass two. Stronger and stronger and stronger. Sure, can you show me a full once again, please? Uh, yeah, so that's the full. Take off the separator to the very end.
almost completely fall into the background. Um, but again, it's a look, you know, it's a style. Um, the satin filters are, the black satin filters are popular because they are a little bit less um, intrusive, they're less obvious. Um, they do the same kind of things, but they're not quite so uh, strong. Um, so there's the black satins as well. Um, but really, the best thing to do is download the software, load in your own photos, and see the effects that they're having. Um, diffusion effects, also black diffusion effects. So you can see how smooth, how it smooths out, smooths out the skin effects. Um, so those are diffusion. Diffusion are used a lot, actually, still. So the glimmer glass, uh, the black satin, uh, the promists. Promists you'll hear people talk a lot about. Pearlescence as well. But mm, a lot of DPs won't go beyond the half. Um, they'll use a quarter and they'll use a half. They won't go to three quarters or full usually because it just it just looks too uh, unnatural. Unnatural. Over over retouched almost. You know, plasticky. That's the thing. Um, but a quarter or a, or a half can lend a, um, a very nice look to skin tones. Dioptos, have you heard of a diopter before? Yeah? Um, diopters are often uh, split, but what a diopter does is it basically reduces the minimum uh, focus distance for your lens. So, you know, any lens, like, has, well, this isn't quite good enough to hear, but any lens has a, has a minimum point at which you can get close to the glass and then it won't, it won't focus anymore. Okay, that's the minimum focus distance. So if you look at any technical specs of any lenses, it will have a minimum focus distance specified. Um, so a diopter can reduce that by half or even a quarter. It can let you focus on something very close to the lens, but usually then you can't focus to infinity anymore. Um, so, but it's used for those kind of close-up shots. And you can do some special things with it too. Um, a split diopter, um, actually is split down the middle. Um, so they're manufactured as full cover or split diopters to ex add extended focal depth of field. So I've got an example here. Any of you Star Trek fans? No, no trekkies. Yeah, old school. Old school. Old school. Yes. This is old school. Yeah, William Shatner. William, William Shatner. William Shatner. <laughs> you can see the effect of a split diopter here. So normally, you can tell from the blur in the background that this is a fairly shallow depth of field. This is probably an f5.6 or something like that. It's not ridiculously shallow like f2, but it's it's shallow. It might have been f4, f5.6. Normally, this guy would be as blurry as the background here. Okay, mm -hmm. but a split diopter for some particular reason in this framing, in this shot, it was important. We were interested in what Captain Kirk was thinking or saying, and he was thinking or saying something about this guy in the background. And it was important for the viewer to concentrate here, but also to see this guy lurking in the background. So the way to do that visually was to use a split diopter. So it allows us to get close focus here, and also for the other half of the frame, have focus out there in the distance. So it looks a bit odd. It creates this weird transition area. Um, I don't particularly like it, but that's a split diopter, and sometimes they're used. Um, so that's the effect it does. It lets you focus on two different uh, distances at the same time, basically. By You'd actually be focusing on this guy um, in terms of the focus scale on your lens, but then the diopter half would be sitting on this side and it would let you would bring in the, the focus point a lot closer. Um, if you're underwater, will the, because the light of the will affect that's interesting. A diopter or a split diopter underwater. I've never thought about it, so I don't know. Um, it would be tough because, because it's always there as well. So once you once you put it on in front of the lens and you've got your camera inside your waterproof housing, you, it's like it's always on there. You can't take it off. So it'd be like you'd have this split focus all the time. Um, but the, the light of effect? Yeah, I know. Uh, it's a good question. You mean the direction of the light? Yeah, the, the effect of the water is the question. That's beyond my knowledge. Yeah. It's a very good question, but I don't know the answer. Yeah. Um, so 
So anyway, this is not so much a filter. It's more of a lens uh, or an add-on to a lens, but we can make them anyway. Um, and then we're going to look at IR control. So we looked at IR control a little bit. Um, we're going to look at it. We're going to have a quick break and, uh, and look at it a bit more closely. But infrared um, uh, IR control can be it can be just an IR filter on its own, or it can be combined with an ND, um, and it just cuts it cuts infrared. So there's various Again, various strengths. There's far red, near IR. Um, there's a hot mirror as well, um, and they they do different things in terms of how they affect infrared. Uh, but this one we're going to look at a bit more closely as well because it's an important one um, to look at. So infrared control. Um, these are the different types of infrared control filters. But there's only there's a the thing is these are all combinations. So um, these are all the, these are like uh, diffusion filters which we looked at. Um, so these are a single piece of glass that has the infrared, neutral density, plus digital uh, diffusion or black protest or whatever. So it's all of these in one, one glass. Um, these are actually, these are actually the different one hour filters. These are combos. IRMD um, plus polarizer, IRMD plus water glass. Um, but we'll look at this more closely after we break it um, I'm just checking the time, it's 412. We've only got till 5. Okay, we don't have time for a huge break, or I'm going to miss stuff. Um, so let's break for maybe 10 minutes. Um, and then, yeah. I have a feeling we might go past five anyway a little bit, but if you can stay, stay, otherwise I'll get through the most important stuff first, and then if you have to go, you can go. Um, it, won't be, it won't go much past five, but I might take a little bit longer. Um, yeah, so let's, let's do ten minutes. Um, the effects of these uh, three control factors, depth of field, uh, aperture, Controls depth of field. Um, ISO is associated with noise, okay, um, and shutter speed affects motion blur, okay. So all three of these can affect your exposure in the camera, but there's always going to be a trade-off. There's always going to be something you're going to get in exchange for playing with one of those variables. Um, if you're in a low light situation and you don't have enough light and you need to increase your ISO in the camera, the payoff is you could get, you're going to get more noise in the image, in, in the, the dark parts of the image, because an image sensor is not variable in its sensitivity. It isn't. Yes, you have a drop-down menu where you can change the ISO, but it's not physically exchanging the sensor for another sensor. Um, it's just... Oh, uh, noise and motion blur. Um, when you increase the ISO in camera, all you're really doing is still underexposing the sensor, but just amplifying the signal. So when you amplify the signal, suddenly your image gets brighter, but all the noise that's hiding at the bottom also gets amplified, and that's why you get a noisy image. Um, so, um, so yeah, everybody's seen the exposure triangle before. It's just it's a good way of, of, of um, illustrating. ISO is associated with the effects of noise or less, more noise or less noise. Um, aperture affects your depth of field, and shutter speed affects your motion blur. So any one of these changing can affect your exposure. Um, shutter speed, you know, if you uh, expose the sensor for a quicker amount of time, you're letting less light hit it, so your exposure is going to be lower, darker, um, at the expense of motion blur. So anything moving inside of your frame. Uh, you know, or inside of your scene, if you have a very fast shutter speed, it's going to freeze edges. It's going to freeze edges of motion. Now, sometimes you want that. If you're a sports photographer or motor racing photographer, you're going for that. You want to freeze that car on the track. You know, you want to you want to follow the car, freeze it, and create that kind of image where the background is streaked, but the car is in perfect crisp. You know, so if you're a photographer, you're shooting at I don't know, above a thousandth of a second, you're shooting really fast. When you're shooting video, you don't want a really fast shutter speed. It, it, it creates
creates unnatural video like looking footage. When you're shooting cinematic video, you want a much slower shutter speed. You want more uh, more blur between frames, you know? especially if you're only shooting at 24 frames a second or 25 frames a second. Um, you need a bit of motion blur in there, you know? um, so that's why our, our normal shutter speed or shutter angle is 180 degrees. It's half of the frame rate. So if your frame rate is 25 frames a second, 180 degree shutter, which is normal, means your shutter speed is a 50th of a second. Or if you're shooting 24 frames a second, at a 180 degree shutter angle, your shutter speed will be a 48th of a second. So it seems like it's quick, but it's it's long enough to give that cinematic motion blur to, to any movement. Um, and then of course, like we explained at the beginning, aperture and depth of field. So the wider your iris is open, um, the more light hits the sensor, so the brighter your exposure, and the shallower the depth of field is. So the more you can get just the edge of this TV in focus, and everything in front and everything behind will be blurred. That's shallow depth of field. When you close down the iris, you get a wider depth of field. It gets wider and wider and wider until somewhere at f22, everything's in focus. <laughs> From foreground all the way to the background, everything's in focus. Um, and that's how, what happens with any lens when you close the aperture down to a really small, fine, you know, and it's also going to drop exposure, it's letting less light in. So these are all the things that, that affect that. Um, and again, this is just a chart that shows. You know, as your iris opens up, your f-stop uh, gets wider, and your depth of field gets shallower, you know. Um, the shutter speed, you know, you can see here, a thousand of a second, five hundred of a second, two fiftieth of a second. Things that are in motion are crisp to blurry, you know. And again, at ISO, every camera sensor has a native sensitivity. So if you ever hear anybody talk about the native sensitivity of this area, Alexa, it's 800. So at 800 ISO, this sensor has zero gain, zero amplification. It is its natural sensitivity. So to get the best results with a cinema camera, you should always try to shoot at its native ISO. Um, depending on the camera, it, that's not always the case. You can push it up and, and still get uh, uh, an acceptable amount of noise. Um, like, you know, with this camera, you can go up to 1,600 ISO if you want, and it's reasonable, you know, you don't get too much noise. But if, if on some cameras, you go up way high, uh, you're going to get noise, and that's, that's explained here. Um, so, so yeah, again, this is where we, this is, this is basically, um, this is why and where we need NDs. Um, like I explained right at the beginning. Um, we want to shoot the ISO 800, ideally, because that's the native ISO of our sensor. We are shooting at 3 o'clock in the afternoon out on the beach. There's a lot of light. Um, we are shooting some people walking. We want a shallow-ish depth of field. So we know, A, we want to be stuck at ISO. We want to stick at ISO 800. Um, we don't want to go down to ISO 100 on the camera because we're just attenuating um, sensitivity. And the camera's native at 800, so we stick at 800. We know because of the depth of field we want, we want to be around f5.6 or f8. So keeping those two things in check, we know we're going to have way too much light. So the only answer is to stack up in these. You know, that's what you do. So that's what the interviews are for. Um, is, is there any effect if you put the one, two, three, and these? Depends on the filter and on the manufacturer. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes, there can be some slight color casts or some kind of change in the color mm -hmm. um, when you put very heavy or like multiple NDs. Uh, like if it's very bright and you really want to be an F2 or something like that, and you have to put a lot of NDs to cut down the light, sometimes it can affect the color a little bit, but nothing that can't be corrected in post. Um, Even after you actually put the filters, you can change yeah. the... Uh, Sorry? 
Hey, you can actually change that in post? No, 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 no. We were talking about uh, any color tint oh. or color difference that the filter makes. Um, sometimes filters will make a slight difference in color. The ND filters, I mean. They should be. ND filters should be neutral. Right. That's why they're called neutral density. So but if you stack them. But sometimes they do. Especially if you stack a lot of them, sometimes there'll be a little bit of a color shift. But it will never be so bad. That, I mean, it will always be able to be fixed. Not fixed, but corrected in post. It's never that bad. Um, and then the ND grads, again, it's the same principle, but they just go from ND to clear. So you can affect just half of your image. Um, so we're going to quickly, because it is more fully already, we're going to look at infrared. Um, so electromagnetic spectrum, a little bit of physics here for you. Uh, you know, our visible light, it's the same spectrum as, as the whole electromagnetic spectrum from you know radio waves that you listen to in your car to microwaves um, that you heat up your food or whatever to infrared to our visible spectrum to ultraviolet x-rays gamma rays um, it's all on the same spectrum so our visible spectrum is between 400 and 700 nanometers that's that's wavelength um, and infrared is anything below red and ultraviolet is anything above blue or above purple. Um, we can't see the infrared. We can feel it though. Um, infrared is heat. So when you're outside under the sun and you're feeling heat on your skin, believe it or not, you can't see it. It's invisible to your eyes, but that's infrared. That's radiation down here. Um, uh, ultraviolet, again, you can't see it, but that's what gives you a sunburn. So it's all part of the same spectrum, but because our eyes are only sensitive to this, this is our visible spectrum. But the rest is still there, it's just invisible. Um, and it can screw up our image. <laughs> so that's, that's why it's important. Um, this stuff doesn't, um, unless you're shooting film. Some films are sensitive to x-rays, for instance. Like if you break your leg, and okay, it's done digitally now, but back in the day when it was done on film, plates, Yeah, internally built in. Yeah, internally built in. It's a very thin piece. 
piece of glass that covers the sensor. Right. Um, and those cameras won't be affected like this, but some cameras, they don't put an infrared filter in front because it, it, it increases their dynamic range number. So they want to market a camera which has 14 stops of dynamic range. If they build an IR filter in front of the sensor, it may only have 13 stops of dynamic range, which isn't as good for their marketing material. Yeah. So, you know, it's a situation where probably their engineers are, are bashing their head against the wall, saying it needs an IR filter, and the other guys in the company are saying, skip the IR filter because we want to say that it has 14 stops of dynamic range. Um, so the, 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 the solution is using an IR ND. So an ND, when you need NDs, that has an IR cup in the glass. Um, and then you use it, and it lights up black. Again, it doesn't look like this. Because this is a, is, sometimes it's impossible to correct in post. Um, if it's not too heavy of an ND, like if it's an ND uh, 0 0.3 or something like that, um, you, can, you can correct it with it. But if it's very heavy, like you've well, had to put, you know, stack a lot of NDs, yeah. you can't even save the shot. Once we tried, we stacked a couple of NDs. Because when the red came with the motion mount, mm -hmm. it had a set of built in NDs. Mm -hmm. So we pushed it to the maximum to see all the results work. And uh, this had happened. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not able to recollect whether they had the IR filter in front or not. The Ari has. Yeah. I'm not sure whether they Yeah, see no, for instance on the Alexa or the Alexa Mini, yeah. this doesn't happen because yeah. it has a built in for the yeah. time. So that's where the IRNDs are important. And and they don't hurt. So even if your camera has IR on the sensor, uh, it doesn't hurt to use IRNDs instead of NDs. So if you're buying NDs and you're investing a set of NDs, it almost makes sense just to get IRNDs anyway. Um, because they're flexible, you can use them on any camera. Mm -hmm. um, so, do you have a picture of it? No. Do you have a reference image? For, for an IRND? Uh, I've got some IRNDs. This one's an IRND. Something done already yeah. that he wants to see. Oh, like the four yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I don't. Alright. Uh, I look up there. Um, for, for example, in this case, if the actress it doesn't move that much because maybe it's just a talking head or something. Wouldn't it be better to use a high shutter speed instead of any filter? You could. Yes. If she's not moving a lot, really you could good. choose to, to increase your shutter speed mm -hmm. instead of putting in these. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If there's not a lot of motion in the frame, you wouldn't necessarily miss the motion blur. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you could do that. It just depends how much motion is happening in frame. Um, I mean, we can quickly look at some, some effects. I mean, the, the Alexa Mini has, um, has NDs built in, which is quite useful. So you can see that, you know, um, you know then you've got to increase. So we're at, with, with no ND, um, there's not a lot of light in there, but we're at F. Well, we're all the way open. We need more light. 
shooting with that filter, right, and add additional lighting, I would still the depth of field would be the same. Uh, it depends on it all depends on the aperture. So like the, if you're brightening up the two subjects in the front, right? If you just brightened up two subjects in front, mm -hmm. yeah, and so the background was out, the, the depth of field would remain. Yes. The depth of field would remain, yes. yeah, unless then there was you needed to you needed to uh, you close it. down yeah. aperture a little bit for the increased light in the foreground. Okay. Then it would, it would bring. I mean, it would widen your depth of field. Um, again, so I mean, if you maybe if you put on your soft light, like, yeah, then you move. Oh, I don't think I can. Uh, no, I think we're going to go away. I don't know if we'll swing. Um, no, they won't swing. But anyway, um, so the, the Mini has built in NDs. Some cameras do. Some of the Sony's have a built in filter reel. Um, that's really useful um, because then you don't have to invest in filters. Um, but some, some don't. So, I mean, you know, that's, that's typically what your map box is for. So you probably all know this already. But anyway, that's a filter track, you know? So some map boxes will allow uh, one or two stages to rotate. And that's particularly good for your polarizer, because your polarizer, you want to be able to rotate. That's how it works. Um, a lightweight map box like this one doesn't come with any rotating stages. They're all, it comes with three filter stages, three trays, but they're all fixed. Um, because they want to keep the weight down. Um, so, you know, your, your filter just, we'll use, a, we'll use a blue grad, it just clips in with a little water, and you'll see through the water to the rocks on the bottom, you know. So that's what's that a 4 by 4 This is a 4 by 4 This is a 4 by it fits in a 4 by 5.65. Um, it's actually 5.65 okay. by 5.65, yeah. But it fits in there, and it's just useful because it adds a rotating stage to a map box that doesn't doesn't actually allow you to rotate the whole thing. Um, and then, um, so that's pretty useful. But there's a, you know there's a few a few different uh, companies are making the same kind of thing. Now. And what's that called? This is called a rotor a rotor polar. Um, the other thing to mention is there's what's called a variable ND. Anybody heard of a variable ND? Absolutely. Yeah. But they, but this was a little bit different. Well. Yeah, a variable ND. You're most likely to you're most likely to see a variable ND as a round filter, mm -hmm. um, and usually they come in different thread sizes for photo lenses, and you'll rotate it, and it's actually made from two pieces of glass, and uh, as they rotate one in front of the other, um, they optically cut out light of various amounts. So as you rotate it, it can go from perfectly clear down to really, really black. Yeah. So as you rotate it, you can really get exactly the amount of light coming through that you want. So one variable ND can replace the need for four or five oh. solid ND filters. Um, now. That's mostly, variable NDs have mostly been in the photographic side of things, because they're the round ones. Uh, but again, there's one like this now. Um, this is a polarizer, but there's one which is a variable ND. Um, where, again, you slot it in, and when you rotate this, it gets darker or it gets more, more clear. So you have a polarizer as well as an ND variable option? This, yeah. 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 So if you use both of them, you'd have... Uh, you fill up two trays, so you'd even still have one tray left, because this has three trays. So you'd be using two trays, and you'd have variable ND, which means you don't need to carry around a whole set of solid NDs. Um, and you have your polarizer as well, so there's different options. Um, but uh, so, uh, some of this variable in this, uh, I suppose, some of my students are very, some of them give you a green cast. Yes. This, the Tiffin, this is a polarizer. We did actually, I tried to get the variable ND version of this here. We've ordered it, but it's not all right yet. So I wanted to show you that, but it, it's not here yet. You but yeah, you're 100% right. right. Some variable NDs can affect the color. Yes. Um, generally, you get what you pay for. Yes. I hate to say that, but generally, the more money you pay, the less the color. The, the more money, the less you need. <laughs> the more money you pay, the less money you have left. No. Um, I mean, yes, but the more money you pay for a variable ND, the, the better the results from a variable ND. There are some cheaper ones um, that will affect the color on the image, but um, the really good ones do tend to be expensive. But when you compare the cost,
rats. You're probably upwards of 7,000 dirhams into your filters, you know. And I mean, yes, they come with a 10 year warranty. They're not, as long as you take care of them, you don't scratch them, you don't break them, they will last forever. Um, but it's an investment, you know, it's a lot of money, whereas a very lady can cost a lot less. Um, and the last thing I wanted to show you um, is this little guy. This is, this is fairly new. Um, and it's also made by Tiffany, it's called the Pro Remember. Um, and I've been shooting with this actually a lot on the that Fuji I mentioned. Um, and this is made for our DSLRs, our mirrorless cameras, um, and it allows us to use a standard Cine 4x4, these are 4mm spec, um, any of the filters, and it slides in. You can, you can use up to two filters, so I'll pass this around, or you, or you can just come see it, we're almost done. Um, but it, you can slide into up to two filters. And it has a nice, like, snug fit, so they won't fall out. No, it falls out. No, <laughs> they won't fall out. Um, and you get different sizes of uh, um, adapter lenses that thread onto your normal photo lenses. So any standard, you know, Canon or Nikon or Sigma or whatever photo lenses you've got, you get the right size ring. Um, and this just clips on, it's very lightweight, and then you can use any of the cinema filters. You just stack them in there. Uh, it works really well. Um, so yeah, and you can take it off, you can shoot. Uh, so compact, lightweight, yeah, like I said, wide range of uh, sizes of adapter rings. Um, Is there a rotate available on a rotor for that one? Well, it doesn't, doesn't because it rotates. Oh, that's that's it. Fine. Okay. So you can put a you can put a square polarizer in there and just just rotate it by hand to get get rid of the glare or the reflections you want. Um, so that's one of the good things about it. Um, it's compatible not just with the four x fours but also the four by the wider ones, the four by five point six fives. They just hang out a bit longer. Um, holds two filters. Yeah, it's perfect for photographers. DSLR and mirrorless video, um, and it will fit all photo lenses with the right size adapter ring. And it's just a lot cheaper than buying full matte box um, because you know matte boxes also can cost a lot of money for a good quality one. I mean, yes, there's the cheaper Chinese brands. You know, you can get a matte box without spending a lot of money, but if you want something good, it can cost a lot. The only disadvantage of something like this. Um, is it doesn't give you the obviously the flags that a map box will. So um, you know the the, the 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 cover and the flags on a map box give, let you get rid of uh, you know flares and and light that's hitting the lens from some angle somewhere. Whereas this won't do that for you at all. Um, but sometimes this is all you need. So yeah. Have you ever tried the rotating? On this one? Yeah, on this one. The one you want Well, there isn't one actually. It wouldn't work with this. Can yeah, um, I just to avoid buying four of them? Can we just turn this and increase the impact? No, because the the uh, because the frame for the variable polar is 5.6 so inches. Uh, yeah. So it won't fit in a smaller, it's too big to fit in a smaller holder. Um, yeah, so unfortunately, I mean, the, the, the variable in these that will work in that case and that most people use on a, on a camera like that yeah. are just the, are the round variable in these. And the thing is, you don't have to buy lots. Like, yeah, if, you yeah, buy, yeah. if you buy a 77 millimeter, which is quite a large one, you can just buy step down rings. Mm -hmm. um, so, for every different size lens you have, you just make sure you've got a step up ring to 77 millimeter. And then you can always use the same 77 millimeter diameter variable ND on any of your lenses just by using that ad adapter. Mm. Um, it saves you buying lots of different sizes of diameters of filters. Yeah. So it can cost a lot too. Um, I mean, so. um, the only other thing I had I wanted to show you, but we run out of time. I'll run it in case some of you want to uh, stay.
they go through no filter and filter side by side, um, and they go through all the different diffusion filters, and you can see uh, how.